Welcome to another episode of College Town Talk. I'm Shan Stout, joining you from the frozen tundra of Cookville, Tennessee. <laughs> and I'm Jonathan Frank. Yeah, what a, a crazy weather week we've had, Shan. And this is airing about a week after we're recording it, so hopefully people will have uh, thawed out by the time they hear this. But what did you do with your snow days? <laughs> well, this is a very unexciting answer, but I work from home, Jonathan. Um, I'd much rather be in the office, so... I'm so happy to be back where uh, I'm not having to feed kids in between uh, taking meetings. So this is just lovely. They're just going to have to fend for themselves today. <laughs> well, I, I'm like you. I was working from home, uh, which I know my dog appreciated. But I have decided the real MVPs of this snowpocalypse, heated blankets and DoorDash. Oh, I absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> all the hot cocoa we can drink. Well, thankfully, we've got uh, two great guests to warm up with today. We're talking to Dr. Jennifer Shank, the Dean of the College of Fine Arts at Tennessee Tech. And you know, she's not a regular Dean. She's a cool Dean. She's going to tell us all about Artie Gras coming up on March 2nd, as well as about her journey to Tennessee's college town. And Shan, I was so fascinated to learn that she taught music at the middle school and the high school level in four states. Yeah, she's pretty fetch. <laughs> But so is our other guest today, Cookville's own media mogul, Larry Stone of Stonecom Radio. Now, we're going to talk to Larry about his legendary broadcasting career and what made him decide to start a network of radio stations right here in the Upper Cumberland. I listen to him on News Talk 94.1 every morning when I'm driving to work. He does uh, such an important service, keeping us all informed and also entertained. I'm looking forward to that conversation. But up first, it's our interview with Dr. Jennifer Shank, Dean of the College of Fine Arts at Tennessee Tech. Welcome back, everybody. Our next guest is the founding dean of Tennessee Tech's College of Fine Arts and one of the people behind the magic of Tech's upcoming Artie Gras celebration taking place at the Salt Box Inn on March 2nd, Dr. Jennifer Shank. Dean Shank came to Tech in 2012 and previously chaired the university's music department, which of course is now its own school inside the College of Fine Arts. She served from 2015 to 2017 as dean of the College of Education. Dean Shank holds an undergraduate degree in music from Shepherd University and a Master of Music and PhD from the University of Kentucky. Dean Shank, welcome to College Town Talk. Thank you so much for having me. I think this is a great podcast and I feel very honored to be joining you. Well, Dean Shank, we're eager to talk with you about uh, Artie Gras and the great things happening in the College of Fine Arts. But first, we have to talk about the college itself. Uh, the College of Fine Arts is the youngest and, I understand, the fastest growing college at Tennessee Tech. It was established in 2017 with you as its founding dean, which also elevated the music department, which you previously chaired, into its own school. And the college now encompasses our theater department as well, which I know has provided a pathway for additional resources and support for the program. So what does it mean to you uh, for fine arts to now be elevated to its own college at Tennessee Tech? And practically, what does that mean for students who are thinking about coming to Tech to pursue a fine arts degree? Well, being elevated to a college really gives us an opportunity to showcase the amazing fine arts that we already had at Tech. Tech had an incredible history of the fine arts, starting with Mrs. Derryberry when she became the first lady all those years ago. It was so important to her to have music and art and fine arts programming. And to be frank, without Mrs. Derryberry, we wouldn't be here. So we're incredibly grateful. But that means that Tech now has a college of fine arts, which allows me as Dean to advocate for the fine arts, anything that the university is doing. We're incredibly well. Uh, supported by the university, and it allows us to showcase the art, music, and theater that was already happening here. It's just prior, as you alluded, it was under the College of Education. In the case of theater, it was under the College of Arts and Sciences. So for current students, for potential students, for our alumni, it's so much easier to see what amazing things are happening in the fine arts now. And it just shows that tech really has invested in the whole student, right? So it's exciting. Dean Shank, you've been a leader in this community for more than a decade, and you've been such a vital part of promoting arts culture in the Upper Cumberland. 
but you've also lived a lot of your life outside of Tennessee too. You studied in West Virginia, I believe, and Kentucky, um, previously held a faculty role, role in Mississippi. Uh, you even taught music at the middle school and high school levels in four different states. And that's a, that's a whole lot of impact. <laughs> Tell us more about your background and what made you say yes to Tennessee Tech University and to Cookville. Sure. Um, first of all, I cannot believe that this is my home and now has been my home for 12 years. I'm incredibly lucky to be here. Um, I grew up in Northern Ohio, outside of Cleveland, right on Lake Erie. Um, I am the product of arts people, so to speak. My mother's a professional actress, my father a teacher. And I knew I wanted to be in the arts. I just wasn't sure which one. Um, then I, as you mentioned, went off to school to study music and music education. And I've had the privilege to teach in many states, uh, both at the K-12 level and the university level. But when I applied to tech um, for my last job in Mississippi, I knew it was a very special place um, from the get-go. It was kind of a hidden secret. The School of Music at Tech, even then, 12 years ago, was incredibly well-known in the academic music world. And even have an opportunity to apply to be the director of the music department was a privilege. And I will be very honest with you, when I came for my interview, it was April. This is one of the most beautiful places I have ever seen. And as you mentioned, I've lived in lots of states. Lots of states with mountains, actually. <laughs> and I felt at home from the moment I got off the plane and was picked up by one of the faculty. Um, I had the privilege of being here for three days on an interview. And the thing that struck me most, and I will tell anybody that asks this, the thing that struck me most was how altruistic, kind, and generous the student body was. I got to interview with them. I got to eat with them, uh, spend time with the students. And I was absolutely struck by the student bot. After I got here and got settled and was honored enough to be offered the job, it felt like I had put on the best flannel shirt ever that was the most comfortable, the best um, feeling of being here. I remember saying to my spouse at the time, we've been here three days and it feels like we have been here a lifetime. It feels incredibly welcoming. Um, people don't realize what an amazing arts community it is, what a interesting, diverse, fun community it is. We couldn't get over the outside activities. I still don't, 12 years later. Um, so I think being felt welcome and how kind and altruistic our students are was a no-brainer. This is the best decision professionally. And to be frank, I'm raising my child here and I'm so glad I am. This is a great place to be. Jennifer, you're an amazing voice to tourism. So if you ever... <laughs> leave the College of Fine Arts, you're welcome to join us at the Visitors Bureau anytime. <laughs> well, thank you. I I can't tell you what, what a wonderful place this is. Um, I've found my forever family here. I've found kind people, we call it, we found our village. So I can't imagine other people wouldn't too. So I really appreciate the offer, but I do love tech and I do love my job. So I think I'll, I'll be here for a while. Oh, well, it was, it was worth a try. <laughs> Dean Schenk, let's talk more about Arti Gras. Uh, this will be the second annual Arti Gras celebration. It's taking place on March 2nd, and the theme is fairy tales, fiction, and fables. Uh, I had the opportunity to attend last year. It is a beautiful event. Uh, so happy to be on the planning committee, uh, working with you and the great team that you've assembled this year. What is Arti Gras all about, and what can this year's guests expect to see? Arti Gras is about celebrating the College of Fine Arts. I think just like Cookville, just like Tennessee Tech, sometimes our college is a hidden gem. And I very much wanted to create an event that would showcase our students' work and invite the community as a whole to spend time with us, to celebrate with us, and to have a darn good time. Um, Last year, our theme was Mardi Gras theme. That's how it got the name Mardi Gras. And this year, we have transitioned to another fun theme. Um, we found that having an opportunity to dress up, wear costumes. Last year, I was a woodland fairy. This year, I plan to be a fairy tale character. Um, is a surely wonderful way to spend the evening celebrating the arts. Um, I do want to make it clear this is not a fundraiser. We don't actively raise funds for this. This is just about celebrating the amazing talents of our students. When you attend this event, not only do you have a wonderful dinner, you get to dance, you get some amazing uh, cocktails and drinks, but you also get to see our music students perform, our art students work, you get to see our theater students perform some 
scenes. And it's a way to experience what the College of Fine Arts has to offer all in one place. And we have some tricks up our sleeve. Um, there's gonna be some fun events. There's gonna be some surprises. And uh, it's a great time. It's a great way to get ready for springtime, for sure. Well, I love that this event is so elevated because you have such a creative force of people putting this on. So, you know, the sky's the limit. They, there's no challenges that are too great. They just, it's its imagination in its truest form. And I, I think it's beautiful. Now, I know that one of the people helping to make Arty Girl possible is the lovely Kathleen Gilpatrick. Now, we, of course, know she is the president of the Cookful Theater Company. Uh, she is also a beloved local actor, writer, director. She wears so many hats. She's a creative leader. And she's also the public relations specialist for the College of Fine Arts. But you all are more than colleagues. Uh, you tell me that you are dear friends. So I love the fact that, you know, imagining that you are working with a very close friend. What is the experience of collaborating with and working along someone who is such a treasured individual and been a friend to you? How has her creativity helped shape this year's Artie Gras? Shan, thank you for asking. She is, yeah. Full disclosure, she is a dear friend and she is my son's grandmother. Uh, I am, as I mentioned earlier, it, this village of Cookville is magic. And I met Kathy when I first arrived here. Having her creativity as, as a leader in this process has given us so many neat ideas, so many outside the box ideas and concepts. And the other thing is she helped shape our committee. And our committee is made up of some of the most wonderful community people that frankly, I probably wouldn't have gotten to work with otherwise. So I find that is like an added bonus that I get to spend time with people like Anna Dunn from Soulcraft Coffee and Diego Alvarez who has um, his wonderful charcuterie business. And so these are people who are contributing to our, our life here in the Upper Cumberland, but they're also bringing this amazing creativity to our event um, and frankly, I get to sit back and watch what happens when I bring the best and brightest together from our community. And that's another reason to sort of spend time and enjoy this event because it's it's the creativity of all these amazing people. Like as Jonathan mentioned, we have him this year too and I couldn't be luckier. And so, and I feel like Cookville gave me that as a gift too, these amazing people that I wouldn't get to be creative with otherwise. Well, I, I'm certainly bringing up the rear on that committee. I don't know uh, <laughs> how I made the cut, but I do enjoy watching the creativity of everybody else. And I've, I've so enjoyed getting to know all of those people. Uh, finally, Dean Shank, we like to end every interview on this program with the same question. And that is, what is one way that Tennessee Tech has impacted your life? Wow, that's a wonderful question. And what a good thing to have as a through line in your program. I think Tennessee Tech has become the embodiment for me of excellence combined with empathy. This is one of the most, I don't know if I should use the word, but it is one of the most gentle places I have ever worked. And what I mean by gentle is that this place truly puts students first. It truly puts the whole student first. Everybody here, whether they're a dean, whether they're a professor, whether it's upper administration, whether it's the amazing people who feed us all, everybody makes sure our students are cared for and nurtured and get to be the best they can be. And that has given me such a perspective and it makes my job so much better because ultimately it's my job to make sure these folks get a great start in life. and. I have met the most amazing students working here the last 12 years, and I count myself very lucky. So I think, yeah, empathy and excellence. I think we're good at that. That is such a beautiful tribute and a great way to end this interview. Dean Shank, thank you so much for being our guest today on College Town Talk. Thank you for having me. It was such a joy to speak to you guys today. And for our listeners, you can learn more about the College of Fine Arts at Tennessee Tech and purchase your tickets to this year's Artie Gras by visiting tntech.edu forward slash fine dash arts. Welcome back to College Town Talk. If you've ever turned on a radio anywhere in the Upper Cumberland, chances are you've heard our next guest handiwork. Larry Stone is the president and general manager of Stonecom Radio, and he is located right here in Tennessee's college town. You can thank him for our local radio stations like News Talk 
Light Rock 95.9, 106.9 Kicks Country, 93.3 The Dog, Livingston's own 920 WLIV, Sports Radio 104.7, 96.9 Highway 111 Country, and Rock 93.7. That is a long list of accomplishments and a lot of responsibility. Now, previously, he spent 17 years as executive producer and game day host of Titans Radio. Now, today, he's our interviewee, so he's in the hot seat. But most days, you can hear him as the interviewer, including his weekday morning newsmaker interviews on News Talk 94.1, where Larry talks to elected officials, business owners, community leaders, Tennessee Tech faculty, and other notable figures from across our region. Larry, you have been a good friend for a long time. Welcome to College Town Talk. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on with you guys. I appreciate it. Now, we're obviously very happy to have you here, but I want people to understand a little more about your background, if the previous is not enough. Because you're a North Carolina native who came to Tennessee in 1997, I believe, to build a radio network from the ground up. Who does that? That could not have been an easy task. So first question, why a career in radio and why here in Cookville? Well, I was blessed, Shan, that, um, you know, and I, I really feel that I guess the older I get because radio was the only thing I ever wanted to do. And people say, well, why? And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, but as a, as a kid, I would be up in my room with 45s. Anybody remember what those were? Uh, but playing 45s in my bedroom, recording myself on an eight-track tape. Uh, and it's all I ever wanted to do from a very early age. And so I feel blessed that, that it has worked out this way. Why Tennessee? I got a call one day. I was had been the morning man at uh, the radio station in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which itself is a college town, the University of North Carolina, and just decided that I wanted to, I actually wanted to teach. I actually wanted to teach at the collegiate level, and so started my master's degree, got a call out of the blue one day saying, we'd like to talk to you about the Tennessee Oilers, and my reaction was, what in the hell are the Tennessee Oilers, and uh, two days later, I was on an airplane traveling to Nashville to interview with the job uh, with the, when the Oilers were moving from Houston uh, to move to Tennessee. And two days after that, they hired me to build the radio network from scratch. There was nothing. Uh, at the, for those that are from this area, WKDF was a rock station. Uh, WGFX, which is the zone now, which is a sports station, it was also a rock station. And so... They had nothing. They they had zero. They didn't even have a tape recorder in the building. Uh, and so the first day I was there, Mr. Adams and Eddie George were coming from Houston. And I had to go out and buy a tape recorder so that we could do an interview with them. Wow. So, so you're a trailblazer, literally. Well, I at everything. least know how to use a credit card at Radio Shack. So we'll say that. <laughs> uh, Larry, you have interviewed a who's who of Upper Cumberland leaders over the years and shared so many powerful stories and great conversations over your airwaves. Uh, do you have a favorite or a most memorable interview that comes to mind? You know, that's a great question. And, and, and probably if I thought about it for a while, I could, I could come up with one. I, they're all interesting to me. Uh, I just, I love the curiosity. I love learning um, new things. And, and, and we have such amazing people here uh, that give you the chance to uh, learn different things and, and find out about different things. And, uh, you know, I, I, that's the way I've always approached interviewing is just curiosity, you know, just uh, it's not hard for me to act dumb and, and show what I don't know. And I find that if you just if you're just honest with people and and ask them questions, um, you know, you find out a lot of information, and and that's what I try to do. Now, Larry, you now have eight radio stations in the Stonecom family, so I've got to ask: Are you done yet, <laughs> or <laughs> more to come? Maybe well, um, something on the horizon that you could let us know about. 
Well, I'll tell you this. We put four on the on the air during COVID, and if that didn't kill me, uh, I'm not sure what will. Uh, that was a challenge. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there's a lot to it. I, I, probably people don't understand. They probably don't care, but there's a lot that goes into it from the technical standpoint of, you know, building out those facilities to building out the formats to, uh, you know, figuring out how you're going to produce revenue on it. So I, I'd say for right now, we're uh, we're probably done for a little while uh, trying to absorb these eight, but it's been um, the, the market has been so appreciative of, of what we've tried to do here and and try to do it as strong community radio. Uh, you know, radio well, has evolved. Yeah. Speaking of community radio, I mean, you're always looking for ways to be forward thinking. I know that you have lots of podcasts that you now offer throughout the station. You know, you're you're really looking for people that have a voice and be able to lend to various views in the community. I, I really love that piece of your business you. plan. It's it's very, very um, high in technology. You're looking at what's coming and how can we get ahead of that. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, let's be honest. I mean, there are seven appliances in your kitchen right now that deliver music better than a radio station does. Uh, and that's just the truth. Uh, and, you know, so if we're just going to play music, that's kind of limiting in, you know, what the growth is and what the future is. Does radio still have a place? Absolutely it does. But you have to keep evolving uh, and you have to, you know, keep doing things in a different way. That's why our commitment is there to news, uh, because that's something that, Alexa can't do. That's something that a satellite radio station can't do is they can't tell you about the water leak in Clay County. They can't tell you about, uh, you know, a tragedy at Fall Creek Falls, but we can do that. And so we've tried to evolve in that way. We've tried to evolve with the podcast. We've tried to evolve with local shows uh, because again, that's not something that anybody else is doing. And I think that's really the key in all kinds of business is to find places and things and services that aren't being provided by somebody else you know it's it's kind of hard to compete on cheap hamburgers with mcdonald's i mean they kind of do that and they do it well and so let them do it and you figure out something else that you can do well larry you and your team do such a great job of news gathering and providing timely news and information and 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 feature conversations here in the upper cumberland and doing it with a level of sophistication that uh, might be you know befitting of of a, a much larger city or larger market and so i want to thank you for that but larry you are obviously a seasoned broadcaster so is my co-host shan and i am not <laughs> let me say it has been an adjustment having to listen to my voice uh, played back to me each week as we're piecing together these episodes. So talk with us about the process of using your voice as an instrument to do your job. Uh, did it take time for you to become comfortable with having your voice heard by, you know, thousands of listeners? And, and is the way you talk on the air different than how you talk in day-to-day -day conversation? Um, and then maybe a second part of that question is, you know, you help train up a lot of young talent at Stonecom Radio. What advice do you give them when it comes to having their voice heard on the air? Well, let me start with the advice because radio is a one-on-one -on -one medium. Uh, and so I can't stand when I hear somebody say, hello, everybody. You know, that's not what radio is. Radio is John Ward talking to you one-on-one -on -one and painting the picture of what's going on on a UT field or Mike Keith doing that at a Titans game or, uh, you know, Edward R. Murrow painting the picture of London on fire during World War II. It's, it is a one-on-one -on -one medium. And that's still at its heart what it is. It is still one-on-one. -on -one. It is... You, you would be surprised probably at the number of people that tell us uh, during the holidays, for example, you know, you kept me company. Um, you keep me company at work. You, um, you know, you, you make me feel better when I'm down, even during the snow, you know, you guys, you, you know, you were there for me. And so there is that one-on-one -on -one thing that we don't think of as radio. So that's number one. You know, the voice thing, I wish my dad were here to answer your question because he loves to say that there's the Larry voice and then there's the Larry voice. And 
I don't realize that I do it. I guess I do, but I don't, I don't really realize that I do it. it I mean, do you get comfortable with hearing yourself? You have to, uh, you have to listen to yourself. You have to air check yourself. You have to get better. That's the thing that I think doesn't happen today is that people don't put the time and effort into getting better at it and, and listening. You know, I, when I did the Titans, I would spend part of Monday listening to the entire broadcast start to finish, you know, and, and trying next week to make it better, whether that was the placement of the commercials or this music was too loud or, you know, whatever it is. I, I just think if it's your craft, if it's, if it's what you're trying to excel at, you got to put the time and effort in to get better at it. And, and, you know, there's, there's no magic wand, you know, people, I, I want to be successful. Okay. What are you willing to do to make that happen? And I don't care what that is. I, you know, I think one of the frustrations and you guys probably see, especially you, Jonathan, in the world that you live in every day is uh, I think sometimes there's a feeling among younger people, you know, what do what button do I push? What like button do I push to become successful? And that's not how success works. You know, look at Michael Jordan. Look at Beyonce. Look anybody that you admire in a field of athletics or entertainment. You know, uh, Charlton Heston. You know, he just didn't decide I'm going to be a great actor. You work at it, and you got to put the time in and the effort in, and and it's hard. And you have to fail and you have to sound stupid. You know, I, there are times where I'm glad I don't have tapes of my 16 year old self doing a radio show in Wilkesboro, North Carolina, because I bet it was pretty doggone bad, but it set me up to do things down the line. And I'm proud of that. Larry, I love what you said about keeping people company. You know, radio can can be something that's very, very useful that way. And I just to give a personal testimony, six years ago, I had a, a huge tragedy in my life where I felt very, very isolated, very, very alone in what had happened to me. Um, it literally knocked the wind out of me. And I thought I was just not going to be able to recover. But that feeling of, of being all alone, the only comfort I had is I, I would have to drive long distances during the span of my life for my job. And during that time, I would listen to your radio stations. And I really bonded with the on-air talent. I mean, they were they were my company. They were sure. uh, that that substitute for someone that would be someone that you you felt like they were keeping you company in a very dark time. And I think about even elderly people who are shut in. You know, and I've talked to several that are like, well, I listen to the radio during the day and it keeps my house full of of life and noise. And, you know, it keeps me company. And I had never actually understood those words until I had gone through that. And um, I literally sent a thank you note <laughs> to a few of your on your talent during those dark days because it it mattered to me. It was so important. And it made me have a higher respect for what they were bringing to people that maybe even were going through grief or pain or loneliness. And I just want to, I, I will now thank you because that helped me in a way that, that you don't understand until you go through it, but it was almost a ministry for me. So it, it was, it was very useful. And um, on that, well, let note, me just say this quick, Shane, and I thank you for saying that, but you are the poster for what radio has to be. And if you go to big cities, if you go to Atlanta, if you even go to Nashville, unfortunately, and you listen to the radio, all the announcer says was, hey, that was Madonna. And here's Van Halen. And that's all they say. And, Jeez. you know, again, that's flashing up on the screen in front of you in the car that that's Madonna and that's Van Halen. And so that's what we talk about is you are you connect with that person, tell them a funny story, tell them something about what's going on in the world, tell them about something that's going to, you know, make them cry, make them think, make them laugh, make them pause. Any of those things are fine because of just what you're talking about, that one-on-one. -on -one. And you don't know the hundreds of people that are listening that need that. And it may just be that it's a mama in the car and she's got three youngins in the back seat and they are driving her berserk. And <laughs> Been there she too. wants to hear, yeah, she wants to hear 
you know, did you hear what's happened in New York City or did you hear I mean, all those things? They are personal. So thank you for saying that. Well, it's just the truth and I appreciate it. Now, finally, Larry, we like to end each interview with the same question. Now, whether our guest is a Tennessee Tech student, alumni, faculty, staff member or someone like you who studied elsewhere for college, but has been such a valuable partner to the university, the question is, what is one way that Tennessee Tech has impacted your life? I think that, you know, when I made the decision, I was coming close to 40 years old and was trying to decide, OK, if I'm if I'm going to buy a radio station, then it's time to do it. Uh, you know, and if you have reached that 40 years old number, you probably know what I'm talking about. You, you kind of feel like boy, this thing's starting to sled downhill to, to use some snow terms. Uh, but we're starting to go downhill fast here. And so I was looking for places. Obviously, I did a lot of traveling with the Titans. And there were two places in the world that I wrote a letter to the person that owned the radio station. And one was Cookville. And one of the reasons that Cookville appealed to me was Tennessee Tech, because it provides in this community so many things the community this size would not have. I mean, we have a symphony, you know, we have a fine arts program, we have theater, you know, we have sporting events, we have uh, all of those. And then just the, I call it worldliness, I guess, that we have here of experts in so many different fields. And that's not something that a community this size should have. Morristown, doesn't have that you know we have that here in cookville because of tennessee tech being here and we shouldn't take that for granted i mean that's a it's a valuable gift that we all enjoy because this university is located here i think that would be my simple answer to the question well speaking of something we all enjoy it has been a pleasure to interview you today thank you for being our guest on college town talk Thank you for having me. And for our listeners, you can learn more about Stonecom Radio at stonecomradio.com. We want to thank Dean Jennifer Shank and Larry Stone for being our guests today on College Town Talk. We sure do. And thanks to you for tuning in each week. Now, don't forget to check out our website at tntech.edu forward slash College Town Talk, where you can listen to previous episodes of the show and send us your feedback. Now, while you're at it, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, five stars, of course, and share this podcast with your friends. We'll meet you back here again next week for more conversations with the people who make Cookville Tennessee's college town. College Town Talk is presented by Tennessee Tech University in partnership with the Cookville Putnam County Visitors Bureau. Your hosts are Jonathan Frank and Shan Stout, and original music is performed by Andrew Buckner. Visit us online at tntech.edu slash collegetowntalk.